Amen. So keep your place there in Ephesians chapter 4 and look down at verse number 26. So we're going to look at uh, verse number 26 here just as a means of introduction this morning. Look down at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 26 where the Bible says, Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So notice the first part of that verse where the Bible here says, Be ye angry and sin not. So it's saying, Be angry but don't sin when you do it. So the Bible here is saying that there is, there is a righteous anger in the Bible. And my goal um, this morning, I mean, you know, to you, uh, anyone that knows the Bible knows this is true. Obviously, God um, in the Old Testament and, uh, you know, uh, is angry very often um, with his own people. Um, we're going to look at that a little bit this morning. But Jesus himself you know, is angry at times. Tell me that Jesus, when he went into the temple and he actually made a whip to beat people with and flipped over the tables of the money changers in the temple, tell me that he was not angry when he was doing that. Tell me when Jesus was saying that the Pharisees were vipers and that, you know, I mean, just, just dressing down these people for having a false gospel and what they were doing. He was angry many times, but obviously Jesus was without sin. So the point is, I'm trying to get you to understand, there's a righteous anger. This idea that Christianity, that, that to be a Christian, you just have to just accept everything and just never be upset over anything is, is a lie. And that is not what the Bible teaches. We are to be righteously angry when, um, you know, when, when situations call for it. And that's my goal this morning. My goal this morning is to make you angry with a righteous... Um, if, if you're not upset or at the end of this sermon, you know, I've failed this morning because I'm trying to give you a righteous anger over some things this morning. So my goal is to make you mad this morning. You know, this isn't one of those sermons that's just going to make you just feel great about everything and, and uh, all the, you know, everything that's going on. But, you know, hopefully um, you'll have a righteous anger the sermon this morning. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 20. So we've been going through this sermon series um, every few weeks about called professing, um, or yeah, called um, confounding the wise. I can't even remember my own sermon series. Confounding the wise. And um, I'm going to address a few of the things that some of these atheists or agnostics talk about when they, they accuse God of being genocidal. They accuse God of being just full of vengeance and wrath. I want to show you this morning the reason that God, I want to address to you this morning, just as means of introduction, setting the stage before we talk about how we apply that to things that are going on today, but I want to set the stage for you this morning and explain to you why God did some of the things that he did. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20. Of course, when the children of Israel came to the promised land, they were to wipe out the nations that they met that they that were possessing the land at that time um, on command of God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 20. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, But of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and the, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. So they were commanded to just wipe these people out. Verse number 18. Why? And then God gives a reason why right here. He says that they teach you not to do after, and then underline these three words, all their abominations, which they have done unto their gods, so should ye sin against the Lord your God. God is saying here that these people need to be wiped out because if you don't, completely, utterly destroy them if you leave a remnant of these people. And we know they did this as we studied through Judges, as we studied through Joshua. We know that they, they started to make peace. They started to put these people into you know, um, servitude to them. They started to not utterly destroy them. But the Bible here is saying, God is warning, He's saying, look, if you don't utterly destroy these people, you will start to do what they do. You, the children of God, will start to do what these people do. More on this later. You know, this is also why God put in certain laws in the Bible to protect again against this. But, you know, this is what God is saying. Look, this is the truth right here. 
Now, when somebody like Richard Dawkins says that, you know, we're going to have a post-religion society. We're going to have a post-religion society where we look back on this time when people believed in God or gods or any kind of God at all. You know, we're going to look back on that as a dark time. Look, there will never be a post-religion society. There will never be. 100%, 1,000%, it will never happen. We may forget the God of the Bible. That's happened many times. But then what we will do is we will go to false gods every time. Why? Because God gave us a conscience and we are searching for God in our heart from the moment that we are born. We are searching for God at that point in our lives. So until somebody can figure out how to get rid of your conscience that God gives you, which will never happen, there will never be a post religion society. But what will happen is as we forget the Lord, the one true God, we will go to these false gods. And along with that comes these three words in verse number 18, all their abominations. So it's not like, you know, it's not like you just look at, you know, people that, that worship false gods or that, you know, create false gods after they've left the God of the Bible and just laugh at them and just be like, oh yeah, they, they're worshiping a piece of wood or a piece of stone or these, these dumb idols as the Bible calls them. They're not gods. They're stone. They're wood. They're material. They're not gods. However, the problem is, is that it's not just a stupid thing. It's with that comes all these abominations with that. Look at 2 Kings chapter 16. 2 Kings chapter 16. Look, only God can see the future. And that's why God can understand that he needs to give this command in Deuteronomy chapter 20 that these nations need to be utterly destroyed. Otherwise, we will do these things. God's people will start to do these things. I mean, it seems crazy on its face, but we know that that's exactly what happened because that's what did happen in the Bible. Look at 2 Kings 16. Look at verse number 2. Look, these are historical books here. These are historical events that happened. And it's, it's in the Bible. It's true. It's never been proven wrong, and it never will be. Look at verse number 2 of 2 Kings chapter 16. I'll just give you one example. There's many examples of this in the Bible. 20 years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. But, so he didn't do what God wanted him to do. Instead, he did this. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire according to the abominations of the heathen. This is the abominations that Deuteronomy chapter 20, that God was warning us about with these false gods of the heathen. This is the abominations. God was telling us, look, this guy, they, these people, when they went to worship these false gods, just like the heathen that they didn't destroy, they began murdering their own children. That's what this means. That's an abomination. You know what that means? That means God hates it. That means God, God hates it. And he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Then Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramallah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, but they could not overcome him. And at that time, Rezin, king of Syria, recovered Eloth to Syria and drave the, drave the Jews from Eloth. And the Syrians came to Eloth and dwelt there unto this day. Look, is it God's fault so let's address this idea that God is just this meanie head, genocidal, maniac murderer that just wipes people out. Look, is it God's fault that left to ourselves, we will literally start creating false gods and murdering our children? Is that God's fault? God's people did this. Ahaz was king of the lower kingdom, which was inherently better than the northern kingdom, and they started doing this. They started worshiping these false gods and sacrificing their children. A couple genera generations later, Manasseh did the same thing. Started worshiping false gods, sacrificing their own children. Look, is that God's fault that people do that? That people start, they leave him and then start murdering innocent people in their society. I mean, think of Israel here. They had the oracles of God. They had the Bible. 
They had the instruction. And just because they didn't listen to God, they ended up doing these things that the other nations did. Let me give you another example. Go to Genesis chapter 18. God, by giving that command in, Je in Deuteronomy chapter 20, God, you know what He was doing? He was trying to protect the innocent. He was trying to protect children. That's what God was doing. And He was trying to protect children for generations to come. God was being merciful to the innocent in Deuteronomy chapter 20. Let's look at another example. Look at um, Genesis chapter 18. Here we're looking at Sodom and Gomorrah. Very famous story in the Bible. Look at Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 20. Of course, we know the story of Genesis chapter 19, but just look back at Genesis chapter 18 and look at verse number 20. The Bible says, And the Lord said, He's explaining, He's explaining why He's going to destroy these cities. God says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have all done according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So, of course, Abraham, you know, he, he intervenes for Lot and says, God, you know, the Lot is, a, is, a, is saved. Can we get him out of there? But the reason, the very base reason, and we know that there's all sorts of unnatural perversion and homosexuality going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But look at what God says. God says that the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah, twice he uses that word, is the cries coming from those cities. Who, who were the cries? Look, we see, we see in Genesis chapter 19 the wickedness that was going on there by, by men that came into the town in one day. They were attacked and, and assaulted, and they were, they were trying to just, you know, do horrible things to them and, and murder them. But look, imagine someone who lived there. Imagine the, the women and the children who lived there. That's the cries of Sodom and Gomorrah that God was talking about. And God heard those cries, and that's why God was going to judge those cities. So, we, you know, we see the story of the men that come to town, and then God ends up destroying those cities, and they, he destroys the whole plain, the Bible says. He destroys the whole area, the Bible says, because of the cries, because of the, the, the violence being done to the innocent there. That's why God did it. The flood is the same thing. We don't even need to go over that. God flooded the world because it was filled with violence. Violence meaning, you know, just harming innocent people, and the most innocent among us are the children. Go to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. God is serious about protecting the weakest among us. And that is, look, that is the children. That is the children. It's the women. It's the children. God is serious about that. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 18. Matthew 18, or look at the front of your bulletin. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 18, in verse number 2, look, God is very serious about this. Jesus was serious about this. Look at verse number 2. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. Imagine, he brings this child, and this is, this is Jesus' object lesson. You know, this is what he's bringing to church to demonstrate what he's about to say. He says, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as the little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever there shall shall humble himself as this little child. The same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying is that, you know, in order to be saved, you must humble yourself. And that's true. I mean, in order to be saved, you have to let go of belief in yourself and just trust totally on God. That's why it's so much easier to get kids saved, by the way, than it is to get somebody who's much older saved. They have all these ideas, and they're not humble, and they're prideful about their beliefs that they have in their life. It's much easier to get a child that doesn't have all those, you know, preconceived ideas in their mind, it's very easy to get children saved. It's very easy to get children saved. But then he goes on and he says, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. Now he's talking about something different. Now he's saying, look, we need to protect these innocent children. We need to protect the weakest among us. He says, but, he's like, but if you don't, but whoso shall offend, meaning cause an offense, Meaning, you know, commit a crime against one of these little ones which believe in me. 
It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. I'm sure Jesus is not angry about people who offend who offend children, who cause offenses against children. I'm sure Jesus doesn't get angry about that when he says it would be better if they were drowned. Then should they do something like that? Well, Jesus is talking about how serious God is, and we see all these examples in the Old Testament, how serious God is about protecting children. And he's saying it literally here. Look at verse number 7. He says, Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that the offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offenses come. He's like, I know these things are going to happen. Jesus says, I know these things are going to happen. And look, they are happening today. These things are happening today. But Jesus says, woe unto that man by who they... Woe unto those people to who they ha happen because God will have the last say. Just like he did in the Old Testament, he will still have the last say. Look, God is serious. All that to say this. God is serious about protecting children in this world. He always has been. It's no different in the Old Testament than it is in the New Testament. And the weakest in his eyes are the children. So what, is it, what, what does this mean for us? So, first of all, this idea... This idea, there's another idea that Dawkins and these atheists, they press forward that we don't need God for morality. They say, we don't need God for morality. You can be an atheist and be moral. But look, the Bible proves, history proves. History proves that left to ourselves, that without the Lord, spiritually, morally, we descend into chaos. We descend into chaos abominations, and violence. That's what history shows us. I mean, look, it's, it's really, it's the second law of thermodynamics spiritually is what it is. Without the addition of the Lord, without the addition of God's law and, and that spiritual direction that God gives us, we will, we will devolve into chaos and abomination. That's the truth of mankind right there. And so this idea that you don't need God for morality is completely wrong. Show me one example of a society in history where that was true. You won't find it. You know, they used to teach in pu even public school. I can remember this from public school. In social studies, they used to teach us that the fall of every empire was preceded by moral decline. Do they still teach that today in public school? No, public school is literally teaching moral decline today. Public school is like putting the gas pedal down on moral decline today. Let's get this moral decline going as fast as we possibly can. They used to actually teach us that, that every single society, every single empire, from the Romans to the Mongols to whoever it was, moral decline preceded their complete fall. They used to teach that. Now we're, we're, we're seeing how fast we can accelerate this today. And the law, you know, the, the law that God puts in place, so God not only tells us, he not only tells us, don't forget me, don't forget me, don't forget me, completely destroy these heathen people, or you're going to do what they do, and then don't forget, I mean, how many times in the Bible is it like, if you do the things that I say, then God gives them the law. He gives us the law to try to help us, you know, guide our steps. I mean, think of the laws in Leviticus chapter 20. You sit there and you read these laws like, you know, God makes a law against man lying with mankind. Then he makes a law against the man lying with beast. And you're just like, what in the world? Like, God has to actually make laws against this stuff? But here's the thing. Yes, he does. Otherwise, when men forget him, these are the abominations that they go into. So God puts this law in place to help keep us on track um, against all these unnatural things where you're just like, you're just like, you're reading this in the Bible and you're like, are you kidding me? And if it wasn't happening around you, you wouldn't even believe it. But God actually has to put laws in place against this. But the point is, is that God is trying to protect the innocent. God is trying to protect children because if these laws are not followed, society will destroy itself. And it'll destroy itself starting with the weakest people, which is the children. You say, how, how does this apply? How does this apply today? Well, there's two sides today. There's two sides today.
There's one side that's out there. Just in our country today, there is two definitive sides today. And it's getting more and more easy to see these two sides. But there's one side that's trying to protect children. There's one side that's trying to protect children. Did you know that today, there's, and there's like, it, it, this is a positive thing. This is a positive thing. Did you know today there's 26 states, 26 states that have already passed or in the process of passing laws that either restrict or completely outlaw abortion? Amen. 26 states. That's over 50, you know, that's, that's, that's half the country. That's a great thing to protect children, to protect the innocent among us. But that's not really what I want to talk to you about this morning. This morning, there's another side that is getting even further away from the Bible, even further away from this. It, there's a side out there that is literally trying to murder children. They're trying to murder children. First of all, let's talk about science. Everybody loves science so much. And if you want to see biblical, biblical evidence against, their, or not against, but that biblical evidence that life begins at conception, you know, I preached a, a sermon called Violence. Um, about a year ago, and that will cover it from the Bible. The Bible is very clear. Isaiah 44, Jeremiah 1, Psalm 139. Life begins at conception, folks, from the Bible. God is very clear about that. Abortion is murder, plain and simple. Amen. Abortion is murder, plain and simple. But let's talk about science just for a second. Because everybody, look, the, godly, the godless, they only like the word science when it suits them, when they can properly twist it. But here's the thing. A person... A person born versus not born, and this idea of person, personhood, there is no scientific connection between a person who's not born and a person who's born. There is nothing there. Is nothing there. The only thing that you could scientifically say where life begins, that only line, is after conception. That's when the DNA, new DNA is formed of a new person. Isn't that what everybody likes, the genetic code? A brand new genetic code. Is not formed after birth. It's formed after conception. Look, there is, how about this idea, these pro, a lot of pro-choice uh, people, I even hate that word pro-choice, but a lot of pro-choice people will say, well, you know, it could never survive on its own. You know, a child, you know, in the womb, they'll never say a child, but, uh, you know, a child in the womb could never survive. Well, a baby can't survive on its own. What, what, what kind of argument is that? A newborn baby can't survive on its own. A one-year-old baby can't survive on its own. But you're going to start to see that they don't really care about that line between born and unborn so much. And so I hope, you know, some of the things that I'm going to read to you today are probably going to shock you. Are probably going to shock you, but they shouldn't. They shouldn't because this is where it's been heading for a long time. Look, there is no scientific, the point I'm trying to make as we begin here is that there's no scientific line between born and unborn. It is after conception, it's a new person. That's it. That's what science says. That's what the DNA says. Abortion is ending a human life. It is murder. That's what the science and the Bible tells us. They match, once again. The science and the Bible match. Now, more than ever, we are seeing two distinct sides form here. Because let me tell you something. As somebody who's been pro-life my entire life, it's, this has been an issue that bothered me since I was young enough to even understand it. It was something that was very, very, uh, very upfront in my family, just this abortion issue and just the abomination of it. But let me tell you something, abortion, there's things changing in this country because abortion used to be known universally as a bad thing. Even the pro-choice side, most people who claim to be pro-choice would, would agree that abortion's bad. That abortion is not something that, you know, it, it's, it, it's not a good thing. But look, this is changing. This is changing. And here's another mistake that pro-life people now are making, is that pro-life arguments now, they're starting to only push this idea of the, the health of the woman. Uh, that, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't legalize abortion, or we shouldn't have, we should make abortion illegal because it protects women. And look, I get that. I understand that abortion is bad for women. But look, abortion, first and foremost, up front, is murder of a person. That is what abortion is. And that needs to be the front issue. 
Because if we start, you know, focusing on, you know, the health of the mother and things like this, which, you know, it's an important thing. That's a person too. But abortion is murder of a human being. And that needs to be first and foremost up front. But the point is, abortion used to be universally a bad thing. It used to be universally a bad thing. But now, but now, while there's 26 states that are trying to make this illegal or more difficult or restrict this, moving to protect life. Let me show you what California is doing. Look at Romans chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter 1. Now let's look at what California lawmakers, if you want to even call them that, are, or are doing. Look at Romans chapter 1 and look at verse number 30. So Romans chapter 1 is talking about people that hate the Lord. Quite frankly, there are people that hate the Lord. The Lord has given them over, has rejected them, and then they've just gone into all these what? These abominations. These unnatural abominations. And then verse number 30, verse number 29, 30, and 31 gives us descriptions of what these people are like and the things that they will do. Look at verse number 30. Backbiters, haters of God. These people hate God. Despiteful, proud, boasters. Look at this one. Inventors of evil things. Let me explain to you what this pill called the RU486 pill is. California, Senate Bill 24 by State Representative or Senator Connie Leva, Democrat, will go into effect in 2023. This is going into effect in California. This is done. This is going into effect in 2023. With the University of California, it, it requires the University of California and California State University systems will be required to offer students medical abortions. A medical abortion is a non-surgical way to terminate a pregnancy that involves taking two prescription pills hours apart. Basically, you can now, you know, I mean, this has been around for a while, but now they're requiring universities to hand out these pills where you take this pill and it kills your child. You don't have to go into a doctor. You don't have to go to a Planned Parenthood, you know, murder center. You just get two pills. And look, they have to hand these pills out to you at the university. They have to give them to you. This is a law. They're turning university clinics into abortion centers. It, by law in 2023, they are encouraging murder. They're making it as easy as they possibly can. Now, look, the, I mean, what if you're, I mean, the medical profession, the medical profession is becoming, it's becoming like the public school system. How could you, I mean, how could a Christian operate within the medical system today? I, I just, I'm not saying it's not possible. But they're turning the nurse at the university clinic into an abortionist. They're turning the, you know, the, the health advisor at the university clinic into the abortionist. They're turning a pharmacist into an abortionist. How could a Christian be in these, in, in these, in these professions? It's like Gresham's Law. Like you, you won't find too many Christians in the public school system anymore because what Christian is going to sit there and teach evolution and perversion to children? The, the, the bad drives out the good. The medical profession is becoming that way. I mean, doesn't the, hip, the Hippocratic Oath, which, by the way, the Hippocratic Oath is like praying to false Greek gods, by the way, just so you know. You sit there and the actual Hippocratic Oath Oath is like, dear Zeus, or whatever, you know, I promise to not do this, and whatever. But the point is, is that the Hippocratic Oath is really, first, do no harm. What a joke. What a joke. The medical profession, they're now handing out these, they're, they're being forced to hand out, like a general clinic in a university will now be forced in 2023 to hand out pills that murder children. It's crazy. You say, man, that's bad. No, that's way worse than this. On March 22nd, 2022, this was just a few days ago, Governor Newsom signed SB 245, which expands access to reproductive health, that's abortion, by eliminating out-of-pocket costs for abortion services covered by health plans. That means your tax dollars now from your California taxes will now pay co-pays or whatever people can't pay to murder their children. That's what this means. The goal, we just got to get as many abortions as possible done in California. But wait, there's more. And you're, I mean, your tax dollars are paying for this. Your tax dollars are paying for this. AB 2223, it's not passed yet, but it's being passed. 
It's in the process of being passed through several different stages. It legalizes self-abortions at any stage of pregnancy. They're basically making sure that none of these laws, none of these laws that could be possibly um, done like these 26 states are doing, they're, they're, they're trying to make a state law that covers this, but then it goes further. It's, notice how it says it legalized self-abortions. You're like, what? What's well, a self-abortion? Like, I don't know, taking an abortion pill? But it legalized self-abortions at any stage of pregnancy. Not that it matters because it's a person after conception. It's a person after conception. But then it goes further. New language added to AB 2223 last week revealed the disturbing intent. The proposed legislation would shield a mother from several civil and criminal charges for any, quote, actions or omissions related to her pregnancy, quote, including miscarriage, stillbirth, or abortion, and then it adds this word, or perinatal death. Although definitions of perinatal death vary, all of them include the demise of newborns seven days or more after birth. Why would you put that in there? Why would you put that, if you're just trying to protect abortion, why would you put this quote in there that says perinatal death, which by any definition, the best definition you can find is up to seven days after birth. Some of them are 28 days or more, these definitions of this word. All of them include at least seven days after birth. The bill from Assemblywoman Buffy Wicks additionally protects anyone who, quote, aids or assists a pregnant person in exercising these rights. It also allows a woman to sue any police department or legal authority which arrests or charges her for hurting or killing her child under the provisions of the bill. Now you go on and you look at like fact checks of all this, this and you go to these, these, these liberal wicked as hell fact check sites, by the way. And they're like, oh yeah, you know, that's not the intent of the bill. The intent of the bill is not to allow you to murder your child. Well, why would you put in there that, that police can't investigate this? Would police investigate an abortion today in California? Abortion is legal. What, what's going on here? You have to ask yourself this question. Abortion is legal in California today. Why would they, why would they say perinatal, and why would they take, put this thing that, that says that the police department or legal authority can't arrest or charge them, and she could even sue them for even bringing a charge against her? No one's going to bring a charge against someone who has an abortion in California. What is going on here? What's going on? You know what's going on. Several attorneys have weighed in on this, by the way. And I'm going to read you. I'm going to read you what these attorneys have said. Look, these are pro-life attorneys, but they're attorneys. They know what the law says. And I'm just going to read you three. There's dozens and dozens of these, of attorneys who have weighed in on this, on what this means. AB22, this is from Attorney and Chief Executive Officer Alexander Snyder of the Legal, Life Legal Defense Foundation. Quote, AB2223 is not only a pro-abortion bill. This is a lawyer. This is someone who has looked at the legal ramifications of what this bill says. Here's your fact check right here. It removes, okay, let me just quote it. I'll stop interjecting. It is not only a pro-abortion bill. It removes all civil and criminal penalties for killing babies born alive under any circumstances. The bill expressly authorizes any person to facilitate late-term abortions and infanticide without legal repercussions. Life Legal condemns the use of euphemisms like personal reproductive decisions and reproductive justice to justify and encourage the killing of babies in and outside the womb. Here's another one from attorney Matthew McReynolds with the Pacific Justice Institute. California lawmakers have crossed a red line by seeking to legitimize the killing of hours old, even week old infants. This is not about expanding abortion rights. This is a degree of evil that overwhelming majority of Americans, regardless of the, how they identify politically, cannot stomach. I hope he's right. That was me. Continue his quote. We will be working to defeat this insane and diabolical bill. Here's another one. Attorney and president of the National Center for Law and Policy, Dean Broyles. AB 2223 seeks to legalize the killing of babies in California after birth. Depending on how the term perinatal is interpreted by the courts, this bill legalizes the infanticide of children several weeks after birth and possibly as late as their first birthday. 
If this barbaric bill is enacted, there will be no criminal or civil liability for a mother or those who assist her with killing her baby post-birth. And you're like, they, they try to make us sound like extremists for getting upset over this. Because no one's ever killed a child before. No one's ever had a child and put it in a dumpster before. No one's ever murdered a baby that's been, you know, after it's been born before. Give me a break. This, look, what, they love murder. These people love murder. And look, they hate children. You must. Here's, here's a quote from the CaliforniaFamily.org. Governor Newsom formed the Future of Abortion Council last year in an effort to turn California into a sanctuary state for the procedure. Organizers listed AB 2223 as part of their legislation package and implement, implemented a 45-point plan to expand and protect access to abortion in California. Boy, we're not 20 years ago, even, even the most liberal Democrat candidate for anything used to stand up and say, we should make abortion legal and rare. They would always say that. Because even the, even the, the wicked liberal who was for abortion would, it, would say, it's bad. We don't want it. But it's just, which, which makes no logical sense then. Because if it's bad, why is it bad? It's bad because it murders. That's the only thing. So even that made no sense. But now they're trying to just expand it. It's just like, the more the better. Even to the point where we can kill children that are, that are born. A few weeks ago, Maryland introduced a bill that decriminalizes neglecting newborns to death. Like if you just take a newborn and, and, and do not feed it until it dies, they want to decriminalize that in Maryland. Using the same perinatal death language. Though the bill, you know, though the bill, the hearing uh, through the bill, that hearing was canceled. In 2019, the Virginia governor, Ralph Northam, was widely condemned for a radio interview asserting doctors could decide to allow children to die after birth if that's what the mother and family desired. This was something that uh, a lot of people didn't know that, that Barack Obama had voted for before he was even president. He was president for eight years in this country. And before he was even elected president, he voted against a bill that would require doctors to give medical attention to a, a child that survived an abortion. There was a bill that said if a child survived, you know there's people walking around today that are pro-life advocates that are survivors of abortion? That there was an abortion uh, procedure performed on their mother and they happened to survive. They're walking around today and they're pro-life advocates. Barack Obama said, no, if a child survives an abortion and is, is right there in the doctor's hands, let that child die. And we voted, we voted him in for eight years in this country to be president of this country. We deserve everything that we get in this country. I need to get hail, fire hail insurance for my house right, right after church today. Because God should just destroy this place right now. Because I, I, does, it, does it get any more wicked than this? Well, I mean, what, what do we have to do? Here's, here's the point, folks. God was right. God was right. Left to ourselves, we will murder our children. God was correct. How could this be? Because evil exists. That's how. Because there's people that hate the Lord that exist. We need to wake up and realize this. These people that run this state are wicked as hell. They're reprobates. And they're all going to burn in hell for eternity. Every single one of them. Every single one of these people that are pushing this stuff, they're done. God doesn't want them saved. Turn to Psalm 82. God was right. Left to ourselves, leaving the Lord, we will resort to abominations. That's exactly what we are seeing. And you know what? We perform those abominations against the most vulnerable first. Because these, abominate, these people that, that are abominable people, they're cowards. They'll come for the most innocent. They'll come for the weakest. They'll come for the, the, just the, 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 the children among us. Look at Psalm 82. Look at Psalm 82. We should look at Psalm 82 as a prayer. We should look at Psalm 82 right now as a prayer. Look, look at what the Bible says in Psalm 82. Look at verse number 2. Is everybody there? Look down at the Bible. Psalm right in the middle of your Bible. 
Look at Psalm 82 and verse number 2. And, and we, we read these things that are happening. My wife told me two weeks ago about this. I don't really pay a lot of attention to California politics. And, you know, my wife told me about this. And you know what I said to my wife? You know what? Because I was, I was actually I was talking to my wife, and I was like, man, there's just a lot of positive pro-life stuff going on in this country right now. I'm excited about it. People are banning abortion in all these states. They're coming out and, look, this is what we've been after for a long time because, like, every state is not immoral like this. There are some people that still have, con there's, there's states that have the majority of people that still have a conscience. You know why they have a conscience? Because of the Bible. That's why. That's the only reason. And there's, there's, there's places that are not as depraved as we've become here. As the majority, not we, but the majority in this state has become. And I told my wife, this is super positive. She's like, yeah, but did you hear about this thing where they're going to allow like, infanticide in California? I'm like, that can't be real. I was like, I can't, I can't, it can't be real. I was like, look, I, it, it's, it, it's real. <laughs> it's crazy. It's real. Look at Psalm 82 and look at verse number 2. God, how long will you judge unjustly and accept persons of the wicked? This is somebody who's in dire straits. And, and you know, we see the same... We see the same um, you know, appeal to God from in Revelation with the people saying, how long? You know, with the, the people up in heaven looking down at the tribulation saying, God, how long are you going to let this go on? And this is what David is saying here. He's saying, how long are you going to accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. He's like, do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. See, see that right there, verse number five? It says, they know, it's talking about the wicked right here. It says, they know not, neither will they understand. No, they'll never understand. People that are for, people that are to this level of unnatural wickedness, they will never understand. They're rejected. That's what he's saying in verse number five. They're rejected. They're done before they're dead on this earth. They're, they're twice dead walking around. They walk on in darkness. See what he says? He says, they'll never understand, Lord. You know, David here is saying, they're never going to get it, Lord. They're walking on in darkness. They're never going to get it. He's like, punish them. That's what David is saying. Defend. Defend the poor and the fatherless. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. He's like, this is not. He, you know what he's saying? He's like, this is not natural. He's like, this is not natural. This is what he's saying. This is why we must resist and speak out against this evil. These people are reprobate haters of God. Plain and simple. It's much more, folks, than liberal versus conservative. It is much more than that. And as we forget God more and more in this country, in this state, and we accept this dogma that God is not needed, it'll just, it'll just get worse and worse and worse. What do we actually see happening? We see it happening. We look and we see it. Look, we don't need to experiment with our own society. We've seen it from the other societies. Why are we doing it here? It makes no logical sense. Can't we learn from the failures of others? It's going to end the same way that it ended for them. But I suppose they don't teach that anymore. I mean, can we honestly say that we're more moral today than we were 200 years ago? Can people not figure out the graph and what direction, the, the, what slope the line is today? This is not, look, this is not rocket surgery. It's easy to see that we're declining morally today. God was right. Leave him, forget him, and we will fall into the worst sort of evil. And, and look, this state is literally governed by reprobates right now. We should expose it. We should shine the light on it. We should not shy away from it. So, um, I do want to give you a silver lining, though. I do want to give you a silver lining um, to leave you with this morning. As, you know, the Bible exposes this evil, as we see this, and we see things like this, and it, it is so clear to us, we're just like, it's so clear to us, we almost can't believe that it's happening. But then when you read the Bible, you can believe that it's happening. But you, you realize that just we're living through it. But here's the thing. Here's how I look at things. We're, we're these weird people, right? We're the saved. We're saved, right? So that's 1% of people. And then we're saved people in this church that are actually doing something about our salvation. We're being fruitful. 
We're going out. We're trying to get other people saved. We're, we're preaching the gospel to the lost. So we're like 1% of 1%. Remember this sermon? We're like 1 in 10,000. We're like super rare. So we're like these super rare group of people over here on this side. Okay? Like 1 in 10,000. Super rare. But then on the other side, you have these super wicked as hell people over here. And look, they're more than 1 in 10,000 at this point. They're saying that, you know, I don't know, 1, 2, 3% of society maybe. Who knows? Who knows? But it's quite a lot of people. You know who we're after? We're after the, 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 the chunk in the middle. We're trying to persuade them. We're trying to persuade them like, you know what? Don't go this way. Because the middle's moving this way. We're like, don't go this way. But you know what? These things, if there's a silver lining at all, and I'm just trying to be optimistic here, it's that these things, we need to shine the light on these things. Because this shows the people in the middle, like, look at how wicked that side is. Look what happens when you forget the Lord. Look what will happen to your children. Look where things are going when you keep moving this way. It's like, no, come, come over here. Come, come this way. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to persuade people. And things like this, because I, I have hope for the, the 95% or whatever it is in the middle. I have hope for them. I feel like they can be persuaded. Because when you show them how clear this is, we're now like getting ready to legalize murdering born babies. And you and I know that there's no difference between a born baby and an unborn baby. But, like, hello? This is where this direction gets you. That's the silver lining. We need to, we need to yell this stuff out. Because people can say, yeah, that is messed up. And then you know what? We can get them over to our side. We can get them over to the Bible side. Because, like, that, that abortion used to be bad all around. And I think that most of those people in the middle... That aren't just these lovers of murder. I believe that they believe that still. We just need to show them what is happening. There's people out there that, that love murder. They hate children. I mean, they hate children. And it, it, like, it makes sense now. Doesn't it make sense that they don't care whether they are born or not now? Doesn't it make sense that that was never really an issue for them? As they start pushing these laws that just allow, okay, let's just slide it a little bit further after birth. Because there's no scientific, moral, biblical, or spiritual, or any kind of evidence that being born uh, makes you a person or not a person. It has nothing to do with it. And you know what? I'm quite frankly, I'm quite frankly sick of morality lessons from this side, too. I'm sick of this side telling me what love is and what hate is. I'm sick of it. You're out here, and you're trying to legalize murdering children. You've been murdering millions of children in this country for decades, you're going to tell me what love is? Give me a break. Take it somewhere else. God's coming for you. That's the answer I have for these people. Look at the last verse of Psalm 82. Because ultimately, this is where it goes. And by the way, Romans 7, let me just read for you Romans 7. You turn to Psalm 82. Romans 7, the Bible says in Romans 7, 9, let me give you a little bit more hope this morning. The Bible says in Romans 7, 9, it says, Paul says this. He says, I was alive without the law once. This is... This is what he's saying about children. He says, I was alive without the law once. He's talking about when he was a child and he didn't understand the law. He was alive. He was not condemned at that point. That's what Paul's saying. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. But when I understood the law, now I need to be saved because he died spiritually. Look, all these aborted babies, all these tens of millions of children that have been killed, all these people that are going to be murdered in California in the coming years, all these children are going to be in heaven. God will take all these children to heaven. That, that is another silver, silver lining for us there. Look, we should be against this and speak out against But God will protect these children. He will take them to eternity with Him, no matter how wicked we get down here. All these abominations that these heathen did in the Old Testament, all those children are in heaven. They were sacrificed to false gods. God took those children and He took them to heaven. And then God went and He came for the people that did those things. And he will, it, God does not change. Hello? We have the Bible. God does not change. Look at Psalm 82. Look at the last verse. Look at verse number 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. That is how it will end right there. And that's how it always does. Why we can't figure it out is beyond me. But God will protect children. One way or the other, God will protect children. And he will judge those 
that come for the innocent. I hope I upset you a little bit this morning because this is upsetting. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.